You're listening to Speak Your Peace, a podcast about social determinants of health. I am your host, Dr. Damian Kelly. A lot of stuff we're doing is centered around social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're just going to go through that. And I will start you off really with the first question is, you know, how did you become what you are today? Are you a Houston native? Give me your story. You gave me some of it before, but I want to hear okay. it. Well, I am a Houston native. Uh, I was actually born in Kashmir slash Trinity Gardens. We okay. kind of, I have family on both sides. So um, that's where uh, a lot of my family came from. But around seven, I want to say, my mother and I actually moved out to Acres Homes, and I've essentially been there ever since. What really kind of put me in this mindset is that I, so this is a very embarrassing story that I'm just going to go, I'm going to go ahead and tell my villain story. Oh, my, please, my, go ahead. My origin We're recording this story. now, so please tell every story you have. <laughs> um, what happened was that when I was about, I think right around the time I started to move to Acres Homes, I discovered who Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee was. I don't know if she had that seat at the time, but mm. she was honoring my home church at the time. And I had a lot of questions about who she is and why Why was the church in such a stir? Because it was a sleepy church. But mm. for the first time in a couple of Sundays, everybody was in a tizzy. I was like, well, who is she? Why is she so important? What did it do? And in the most simplest terms, my mother just said, well, she represents us. She fights to keep our neighborhood safe. That's an oversimplified definition of what she does. Mm. But that's what my brain interpreted at the time. Fast forward a few months later, and all of a sudden, I uh, the, the neighborhood that I lived in is right down the street from the call state, from a, the North Division call station. So I, I, to, to get to the cap end, I think what happened was that there were like a series of robberies that were happening mm -hmm. around the neighborhood and my mother being the good mother that she was, she kept me from riding my bike up and down the street, which at the time was, you know, a really big deal to me because I didn't really do much outside of riding my bike. And in my baby brain, I put two and two together. If I can't ride my bike down the street, then what is Congresswoman Lee doing? Hmm. <laughs> and I made it my mission to try to run for her seat because at eight years old, I kid you not, at eight years old, I thought I could do her job better. <laughs> and so I made it my mission to try to, you know, work in the community. And then obviously I grew up, but I grew up understanding that I was in a place of privilege because my grandfather and my mother worked really, really hard and my family in general worked really hard to get me certain amenities outside of acres homes like the theater lessons the piano lessons the the trips and things of that nature but a lot of people in acres homes didn't get that and i felt such a burden of responsibility that mm. i need to if i'm still in acres homes i need to be able to give what i have to acres homes because not everybody has a mama and a grandfather and a family like I do but everybody deserves to have what I had and so that kind of started my community engagement and that led me down the path but what got me specifically into health equity was really just listening to the needs of the community in order to be like a really good advocate I feel like you really need to listen to the people you're serving like it's it's kind of backwards to say hey I'm gonna serve you but I'm gonna tell you what you want mm -hmm. and I'm gonna give you what you want based off of what I think you need you want after you know participating in like the complete communities initiative and participating in uh, LISC training training for trainers and and working in various offices I saw that there were certain inequities that were in our community that were getting addressed, but there was a disconnect between the residents' participation and the organization's desire to get them to participate. Like the Can you org give me an example, so, don't, but don't say the organization's name. So, so what would happen would be the organizations would have this great plan and idea of of wanting to connect and provide services 
to the community, Mm -hmm. but nine times out of 10, the manner in which they would get that information to the community was inaccessible. And this is not just to any one organization. It's for the organizations. It's for the city governments. It's for the uh, NGOs that were all trying to render services in the community. They all wanted to render service, but it was on their terms. So an example would be there would be a community meeting at like 12 o'clock in the middle of the day. And so you have people in the community that really want to be a part, but you're you're singling out entire swaths of people within the community because you're doing community engagement on your terms. Like yeah. this is my working hours. I work nine to five, so community engagement happens nine to five. At what point is it a participant's responsibility to kind of help bridge some of these gaps? It's that is a fine line to navigate. And I will be honest, I'm still in the glass half full side of social services. And, and optimistic. Uh, I, I'm very optimistic I because like I, I still have the mentality that if you give every single opportunity and make it absolutely perfect, mm. people will participate. And I've had instances where that's not the case, but I still choose to believe that there is a scenario where you can make it picture perfect for absolutely everybody Mm -hmm. and everybody can participate. And on the flip side, you can lose a lot of time doing that. You can lose an absolute tragic amount of time and a tragic amount of resources trying to cater it to every single person, knowing full well that you're going to lose 20% of your participants because they just straight up don't want to. And so okay. it's definitely something that I haven't, you know, found an answer for yet, because once again, I'm still on the optimistic side, but I do realize that that is a reality. So with the themes I'm kind of pulling out, mm-hmm. uh, one is a theme of accessibility. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious, as a CEO mm-hmm. of an organization, do you find that there is that same need for you to be accessible to everyone, to be everywhere So the pressures of that. So it is a level of pressure because in order to gain a community's trust, you have to show that you are accessible Mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Um, And the blessing is that a lot of the work that I've done over the course of time has allowed me to prove that I am accessible to certain individuals who are now my torchbearers to other pockets of the community that I simply can't reach. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's that model that I kind of lean towards because I, I can't be everywhere. I can't. I physically can't be everywhere. And I've learned that several times over the course of the last two years, I'm finally getting better. But mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, I'm finally getting my strength back. But there was a point where I did subscribe to the notion that I had everybody had to have access to me otherwise mm-hmm. nobody would trust me as a as a community liaison or a community advocate or things of that nature but it, it's strategic of mm-hmm. who you get the trust of and then you either work within those networks or you train up people who can go tell your vision for you that you uh, allow yourself to be accessible in different forms. I know COVID changed a lot. It did. How did it change <laughs> your organization? How did it change how you work? You couldn't have done this event during COVID. Mm-mm. How did it? How did it impact you guys? So funny story. Our organization actually didn't come to fruition until twenty two. Okay. September of twenty two. Prior to that, I had a. A for-profit organization called Musically Inclined that I did a lot of my work through, um, and when it uh, when it came to the festival, but when it came to community engagement, mm-hmm. I was just a volunteer up until 2019, um, and with that, there was already a a, re, a rebirth of what I was doing because. There were certain cues I was picking up from the community at the time that w- the smaller projects that was that I was mm-hmm. offering outside of the festival weren't necessarily the interests of the community. Okay. And it was a hard pill for me to swallow. But once again, 
I can't tell you what you want if my whole job is to serve you. No, no. So I was, it was a, it was a, a maturing moment. It was a growing pains moment because I really wanted what my version of community engagement was to stick, Mm -hmm. but that's not what my community needed at that point. And so I was already in a pivot and I had the opportunity in 2019 to work under a state elected official, uh, Representative Johnson, to to uh, better serve my community. Mm-hmm. He really wanted me to come on his team because he really wanted me to help with engagement. And I wanted to come on his team because I wanted to learn how to do this right. Lo and behold, he had a position available for special events coordinator. And so I worked in with him and it blew my mind mm. because going back to that accountability mm-hmm. on the participants part, there's only so much electeds can do on varying levels of government before it's on the community mm. to participate. Yes. And with that, and I just continue to learn. I continue to try to figure out how it made sense in the grand scheme of things. And then COVID happened and it threw a wrench in absolutely everybody's plan. And I found myself in a space where I was a free agent for advocacy and for elected officials. Mm. That summer was like the the worst melting pot possible because it was COVID. It was the George Floyd protests. It mm. was the police accountability movement, which I somehow found myself at the front of with another nonprofit organization. I had to step away from Rep Johnson over the summer. But um, when we got into the summer, I was still on the hunt for how do I do this right? Mm -hmm. How do you, and and that's really what 2020 kind of changed in my mind. How do you advocate the right way? How do you do this work the right way? Because you can go in and just be a ball of fire and make amazing speeches in the heat of the moment. But how is that effective? Mm -hmm. How are you really moving the needle at the end of the day. And if you're only known for being a passionate speaker and effective communicator, but have no substance behind you, yeah. it, it's your, your, your tree should bear fruit. Okay. There's and, a book I like to read that says you can judge a tree by the but, fruit it bears. Yes. There, there's the slogan I was trying to say. There is a method. There was a missing link that by the grace of God, I was starting to, put two and two together why there was such a disconnect between elected officials, Mm. you know, doing the work because it's kind of the birth of the community advocacy group is building that capacity. We don't want to be the, the, the torch bearer for Mm. all of acres homes. We want to really lift up the community as a whole and teach them how to better advocate for themselves. So that, and and that comes with the whole coalition building that comes with the health equity piece. We're teaching them how to stand in these spaces and give them the assistance they need to walk this walk. We're ready at the table. We, we can sit, we can talk, we can speak to what's going on in the community and be able to work in partnership with our electeds to get stuff done in our community. I love that you built your nonprofit during COVID. Yeah. I think, so uh, I am a religious guy and I've often said, uh, actually I had a boss say that I just stole it from her. Uh, (laughs) Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Jackson. Uh, (laughs) That was my old boss at the Houston Housing Authority, Gilda Jackson, one of my bosses. Uh, she, She said, God has a way of clearing your calendar. So I found that with COVID, everything got cleared. Yeah. So so for myself, I was already in my doctor program. Mm-hmm. 2020 hit. Everything was pretty much online. Mm-hmm. I just took that extra time to finish everything up, and I got it done in three years. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people, you, know, you talk to people who were like, oh, if I just had time, I'd write that great American novel mm-hmm. or I would, I'd get in shape and mm-hmm. I'd do, I, I'm laughing because I'm not in shape at all. Yeah, <laughs> no, so me neither. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just an example that, oh, people have said these kind of, if I just had this time, I would start a nonprofit that did mm-hmm. X, Y, and Z. You so, had that time. So what's even funnier is that I don't consider 2020 the time that I created the nonprofit because mm. that was really the maturing phase for me. Because yeah, but yours is 2022, right? Yes. So that was still COVID. 
So it is. Yeah. But I, the the point I was trying to make was that 2020 was like the maturing phase. Mm-hmm. 2020 and 2021 were the maturing phases. Um, so funny story. Uh, I actually. <laughs> Oh, God. I actually broke my foot at the top of 22, like from March Mm -hmm. until April, March until May. I was actually in bed and out of commission because I broke my left foot and I Doing. had a, um, I'm not going to say, because okay. <laughs> I don't want to get laughed out of the room. <laughs> um, but I uh, broke my left foot and I uh, fractured my elbow pretty bad. And so I couldn't work for the better part of a month. And I had to work from home in April. So that whole notion of like God has a way of clearing your calendar, mm. that was almost three uninterrupted months of me thinking, how can I do this better? There's got to be a better way to do this. There's got to be a better way to do this. And it mm-hmm. just stewed until May where I had that conversation and everybody was upset. I was upset because I was working in District B was my dream job. It still is to this day. I I Once I got off my high horse about District 18, I'm never going for that job. Never, ever. For with Sheila Jackson Lee. Mm-mm. Okay, gotcha. Never, absolutely not. Um. But I did resolve to say that I wanted to either work for or run for District B when I was like uh, in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it happened so quickly, I was so grateful. I was like, oh, my God, I'm working my dream job. I'm actually in District B. This is the greatest thing of my life. So imagine the heartbreak and the reckoning that I had to go through in that moment of solitude where God was really telling me, you know I have something greater for you, right? Mm. You know there's a different way that you can do this, right? And I was like, but but I don't want to be ungrateful cuz this is what I asked for. Like I, and and I know you're not. It was a it was a lot of him clearing that space because you can get so down in the trenches when you're doing the work that it's so if we're going this spiritual route, it, it it's so easy to get caught up in the work that you tune out God for the sake of everything that you're doing. Yes. Even in servitude. <clears throat> it's so easy to get caught up in the service that you forget who you're serving. <laughs> what I love about social terms of health that people, uh, when I, I was doing a lecture once at UT for their uh, public health class and I was talking to a young lady who was from Canada hmm. and she was curious how so many organizations, so much funding is going through churches and such mm-hmm. and I took a while to think about it and I talked to her some in class and I, and I really couldn't articulate it until later on mm-hmm. after class was done and life is like that sometimes. Yeah. You think back on it like, oh, I wish I would have said this. Yeah. But what's great about social terms of health, faith is part of that. Absolutely. And hey, uh, and it's multiple faiths. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not just one faith. And mm-hmm. Faith has a large part in determining people's health and how they exactly. overcome certain things. So. Uh, when we talk about these religious aspects of it, we work with churches, we work with synagogues, work with mosques, work with temples, because a, a, a big part of who people are is their either faith in a higher calling, a higher power, or something that's internal happening with them. Mm-hmm. And they express it through their religion, their, their practice, what mm-hmm. have you. So uh, with that... I'm going to segue into something because one of the reasons I wanted to bring you into the studio, because at at the forum, one of our pilot forums we had, Mm -hmm. we were talking about health Mm -hmm. and how perhaps African-American women have a harder time either accessing health care, being believed when they're talking to doctors about higher thresholds of pain. Mm -hmm. And again, I loved it. I loved the conversation. I really wanted to keep that going. I was like, no, I got to interview Rain. (laughs) I got to talk to her about that because I really want your perspective. You said something that has stuck with me since Hmm. about normalizing waking up with pain. Yeah, yeah. Um, ever since you said it, it stuck with me and yeah. I haven't got to shake I'm like no I need can you articulate what you were saying how that came about talk to me so the that topic kind of came about after I had a conversation it was me 
um, and two other colleagues just for, you know, safety purposes. I don't know if they want to be, you know, referenced here, but I'll just leave their names out of the conversation. Best friend A and I were um, going back and forth about how we had, you know, relative soreness, um, but it was it wasn't anything that we couldn't manage. Well, we were both saying we had headaches. Mm -hmm. And then uh best friend B <laughs> came in and said, well, you guys should take something because it's not normal to have a headache like that. And we, uh, A and I, we kind of offhandedly said, well, I mean, we're in some sort of pain every day, so it's not a big deal. And best friend B was like, what do you, what do you mean you're in pain every day? It's like, I, I have some form of Rain, you can't, you're too young. You can't have that all the time, right? It's like, yeah, I have either like a headache or like I may have some tightness in my chest every now and then or, but yeah, I, I typically wake up with some form of pain um, on a scale of one to 10, like sitting at four almost every day. And best friend A agreed. They was like, yeah, I, I mean, I've had surgery B. So what do you, what do you expect? I'm going to wake up with a level of soreness or some type of pain. And it just baffled her to think that people were walking around in pain. And it made me reevaluate. But best friend B was non-African American. No, 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 no. Best friend B was not African American. Best yeah. friend A and I were both African American. Gotcha. And so best friend B was just out of like sorts. It's like, so how do you guys function with all that level of pain? It's like, we just do. Mm. And after I didn't realize the power of that statement, because there's a level of onus on women and black women specifically to just do, because we haven't been given the level of vulnerability or the safety net, uh, the sure, the assured safety net to say, okay, I don't feel good. I'm going to go lay down or I don't feel 100%. I'm going to step away. Currently the, the advocacy group is ran by me. So yes. everything you see from the social media to the website, to the newsletter, to the festival, to the working groups, everything that you see with the community advocacy group is purely me. Mm. That's it. <laughs> like <laughs> I'm running the ball, I'm throwing the ball, I'm catching the ball, I'm I'm punting, kicking, and I'm calling flag on the ball. Gotcha. Like <laughs> I'm doing all of that. But a lot of black women find themselves in that position and so there's really no space for us to take a knee because we haven't been shown a reliable network to keep us from overworking ourselves cuz we've mm. been the linchpin for so long in our families and and if we want to go all the way back to the destabilization of black families then that that's something that could be dived into dove into another day but we have been made such a strong component of our families and of our businesses and lives that there is an over looming fear that if we do step away if you pull the pin it's going to blow up there you go gotcha. and and that's not just in the life but that's also in health too in emotions too because we're really quick to do well some of us are really quick to do Ooh, okay this is a little too emotional let me go do something real quick so i don't mm -hmm. lose it or let me go in a room and cry, cry real quick but don't let me lose it right here but a lot of black women if you ask us you know if we're tired or if we're overworked and overwhelmed we're like one question away mm from just like exploding yeah and unfortunately there isn't a space that's crafted that we can trust our vulnerability to and mm -hmm. i think that's what i was kind of harping on in the in the conversation we were having because even if you go to the medical field and say okay you know what it doesn't make sense that i don't go to the doctor i'm gonna let them know that i've had this crook in my neck or i've had this knot in my neck for the last two years and i need to get it checked out there are several studies, and I wish I had the time to pull them up just to kind of reference them for your listeners. No, no, I believe you. But there are several studies that have proven time and time and time again that there is a, a high level of bias against black women who are requesting either pain medication or certain type of interventions or expressing discomfort because there is a conception that we're lying that we have a high tolerance level of pain. Um, 
specifically if you're looking at cases where uh, people of color have lupus. Mm -hmm. Lupus is um, a more prevalent disease than multiple sclerosis, uh, MS. But there are instances where lupus is is just as an invisible disease as MS until it gets to a point where it's visible and at that point it's debilitating. But with lupus, nine times out of 10, black patients, black and brown patients are turned away because the pain that is described with having an episode is just written off as, oh, you just want extra morphine or you just want more uh, uh, whatever uh, drug to help you go through. You're not really in pain. You don't look like you're actually experiencing crisis or anything like that. Well, obviously, you're not going to see it unless my blood starts to surface to my skin. And at that point, we're already well past the point of no return. Mm -hmm. Like everything that happens to me is internal. Same thing with MS. But MS is treated as uh, a more serious disease and there's more visibility for MS versus people with lupus because there's already a misconceived notion that anybody who's of a darker complexion is just asking for more drugs. And even if we take it out of lupus and go into childbirth, there is a, a depressingly high mortality rate amongst black women in the birth in in birth mm-hmm. because Doctors don't listen when women say that they are experiencing discomfort. And there is a high level of mortality because there is a an automatic assumption that we are over dramatizing our symptoms and we are not able to really be trusted because we just want to get high or we just want to get extra. And I have two anecdotal stories just to kind of compliment Shoot about that. like the the need. Serena Williams, one of the strongest women, one of the most like well renowned women in the tennis industry, had to fight for own her own life when giving birth to her daughter because her nurses and doctors would not take her advice when she said she was experiencing discomfort after she gave birth. Now, that says something, because if high profile women of color can't even be trusted to uh, can't can't even have spaces where they're trusted. It's a systemic thing across the board where Mm. spaces in the medical field no longer are safe spaces for us, because due to the history of experimentation, due to the history of neglect, due to the history of, of biases and things of that nature, practices that are in embedded in medical uh, practices. It's not a safe space for black women to actually go get the help they need on top of the responsibilities they have outside because I can't be laid up in the hospital for two months. I got two kids to feed Mm -hmm. and like, I love you, Lando. Like I, I, I can't leave the house for two days because the the, I, I have to because I, okay. and I'm saying this because there are women who are in relationships that although they love their spouses, their spouses don't understand how to help them. Mm-hmm. So that way they feel confident enough to walk away. And so even if I wanted to check myself into a hospital, I don't know if I can because I got two kids that I need to make sure that they get fed or they go to practice. And my husband doesn't really do laundry or dishes like I've shown him in the past and things (laughs) of that nature. Or like he's not like as on top of things as I am and stuff Mm -hmm. slips through the cracks. And so there is that side of the brain where women kind of go to neglect their mm-hmm. health. But then there's also the dangers of the healthcare profession itself where it's never shown itself friendly. And even if we go to the mental mm-hmm. health side of it, and this is the other anecdote, there was a story of a, a black practitioner, um, a black RN. She was on call for the day. And one of her other nurses uh, came in and said she was going to give a psych recommendation for one of the patients on the floor because the mother kept hitting herself. And it was at random spurts, not really provoked by anything. She just out of nowhere, she just started beating her head. Now, for reference, the nurse who's reporting this is white. The RN is black. And so the black RN is 
trying her best to, you know, keep a level head. You're smiling because you already know where this I is going. I think I know where it's going. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so she looks over the charge sheet to see who is patient in X room, mm. and she recognizes the name, and she says, okay, give me really, go with me here. When they're hitting themselves, mm-hmm. are they patting themselves oh, on the that, head I like this? I this was this. going this way. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and for every black woman that's listening, you already know where I'm going it with scratches, the pat. It scratches. It itches. It I itches. It. And I can't reach underneath my braids, so I got to pat my head. But look at how... <laughs> but, like, it's funny, but thank God that RN was there. To say, hey... That she's not, not losing her mind. Yeah. She's not abusing herself. Her scalp just itches. Gotcha. But look at that. And and then look at the, the number of... The, the rate of RNs that we have in the hospital, mm-hmm. it's not that high to give us the confidence that, oh, wherever I'm going to go, they're going to understand my cultural, cultural context. Yes. And they're going to be able to render services with me, not just from the book, but also from a cultural perspective that I don't get locked away just because my scalp itched. So I'm not a healthcare professional. Mm-hmm. I've never worked in that in that capacity I have coworkers who are that Mm -hmm. so for those who are listening where can this person or any person go or what are they what should they be doing to try to understand this ever evolving changing world and that's a big question it is and you may not have all the answers but just help me out with that so that is actually a really great question because it kind of brings me back to the argument I was making at the beginning is that how committed are is this person to equity? Mm. That's where okay. it starts because if you as a practitioner are genuinely concerned about making sure that you're a practitioner that can serve all people, mm-hmm. then there are several different practices and, and uh, um resources that are available to kind of help you uh, mm-hmm. uh i mean the the texas workforce commission uh the uh texas health departments uh federal health de- like n- not federal health department but like the the uh epa the fda all of these different organizations are already kind of getting in that mindset of mm-hmm. how do we diversify our services for people and how do we take uh, inclusion more into consideration when we are serving people in this nation, but it's a lot of work. You don't mm-hmm. you don't get it overnight, and you don't um, y- you don't internalize that mm-hmm. overnight. You're gonna stumble. You're gonna fall. You're going to uh, um, mistake one culture for another because this is like your first time being exposed to any culture outside of your own. Yes. It's gonna happen. And, and there are going to be language barriers that are going to cause some heartburn where it's mm-hmm. like, I don't think I'm I'm ready for this. It's outside of my comfort zone. And that's the point, mm-hmm. because for the person you're serving, it was out of their comfort zone for coming here in the first place. Unless you're willing to do the work to show outside mm-hmm. of of your practice that you're inclusive of everyone and. There are a lot of practitioners that if you have multilingual uh, paperwork, if you have uh, uh, what you call it, culturally uh, representative activities and not just the stark block things, or if you have like newspapers or things of that nature that show other people outside of People magazine and things of that nature, Mm -hmm. or if you have a staff that's more representative of the clientele that you serve, that already sets the atmosphere of, oh, I can let my guard down here. Gotcha. I can actually, and bedside manner is always going to be mm-hmm. number one. So if you start with those practices and you invest the time to really internalize them, I think you'll actually make the step towards true equitable health care. Brain, I have all the confidence in the world <laughs> with you that you are going to be very successful in this. I look <laughs> forward to continuing conversations. Likewise. Rain. How can the people reach you? Yes. So if you want to follow us on all media handles, except for TikTok, uh, you can, (laughs) I have to put that out there. You can, you can find us at Acres Homes C-A-G. Uh, our website is acreshomescag.org. 
And if you want to email us, it is info.ahcag at gmail.com. Fantastic. Well, guys, we are all done. Uh, shout out to our girl, Sarah, who is on the ones and twos. The producer, uh, our producer, Allison, who uh, is great to work with, as, as always. Uh, Dr. Obasi, who is our fearless leader in the Health uh, Research Institute. My name is Dr. Danny Kelly. And as always, reminding you to do good things.